It's Jane Levy. It stars as Zoe Clark in Zoe's Extraordinary Playlist. I'm Kevin Jacobson of Gold Derby here with Jane. And I want to just start with pre-production on season two. Uh, what were you most excited or nervous or intrigued about exploring with Zoe heading into this season, just based on where you left off in season one? Um, you know, we don't read the whole season when we start. We really uh, get our scripts episode to episode, which is a fun surprise every week um in pre-production for season two I think we had the first three scripts and I knew that I was going to be singing in episode two a little bit and we were going to um do this one act play is how everyone has described it with uh Skylar and myself and then I also knew that I was going to do a song and dance uh dream sequence in episode three and we were able to do some learning of choreography before we started shooting for episode three, because as you've probably read, or as I've said a million times, I'm, there isn't very much room and time and space for me to rehearse anything because I'm basically always on set. And if I'm not on set, I'm in a fitting or, you know, getting my hair dyed. I'm not a natural redhead. Um, (laughs) So in (laughs) (laughs) pre-production, There was a lot of um, focus on making sure that we could choreograph those numbers. Um, But man, you're asking a question that was feels like so far ago, Mm. so long ago, especially, you know, after working during a pandemic, I do feel like in some ways I blacked out the season. I'm like, was that a dream? Did that actually happen? Wow. Well, I think it's safe to say. What's that? Crooked there. No, you're good. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it's probably safe to say that Zoe is kind of messy this season. She makes some choices. They aren't always the best. Or doesn't make choices. Or that, yes. Yeah. Her, uh, her love <laughs> life is kind of all over the place. She yeah. is struggling in her work. Um, so when you're reading a scene or doing a scene and thinking that you, Jane, would not do this or that. Um, Is it difficult for you to still kind of authentically play the character and make us understand where she's coming from? Yeah, I, 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 when I, I'm such a like actor for hire in that when I read scripts, I think, okay, how do I justify this? I don't, I'm not one of those actors that will go to the writer and be like, my character wouldn't do this. Let me tell you why. I'm usually like, okay, what's the most creative approach to this thing that seems maybe absurd or in a direction I wasn't expecting? To me, that's fun. I mean, of course, there have been times when I've been like, "Mm, maybe can we tweak this? This makes more sense in terms of like what we've been, the arc we've been building this whole season. But when I read the script, I go, okay, this is what they've asked me to do. How am I going to do that? And with Zoe this season, you know, yeah, she's messy. And we saw her process through grief in the in season one. And now we see a continuation of that process. In season one, it was like leading up to how do we say goodbye? And then season two, it's like after we say goodbye, what's the aftermath like? And I I personally feel so protective over Zoe when people are critical of her because I'm like, don't you see how much pain she's in? And yes, she's an adult and yes, she's making mistakes in terms of her love life, but like people are messy. And, and, uh, you know, I tweeted this the other day and I feel like it was very ineloquent. I was like on a run and I was thinking about Zoe and I was like, I gotta tweet this. And after my run, I tweeted it out and I was like, I don't know if this totally makes sense, but I was thinking about her and, you know, when I watched the finale this Sunday for my second time, sometimes I'm able to watch Zoe and really uh, be objective and watch her as a character and not me playing her. And I had that experience in the finale and I was like, there you go, girl, you're making choices. I'm proud of you. Life is scary. After you lose someone, you're going to be confused and a little bit of a mess. And I really feel like at the end of the season, there was some closure and decision making and yeah I'm happy for her yeah, me too yeah and um it's interesting because you know Zoe has lost her father she also loses her boss Joan at the very beginning of the season so there's these are these two older mentor figures for her that are no longer around we still see Peter Gallagher in a handful of scenes in season two but certainly not as much as the first season and then Lauren Graham is just 
gone after the premiere. Uh, was it tough to adjust to that on set to not have these two greats around? Yes, absolutely. There was a, a, yes. I mean, for me, the whole show season one was about Zoe and her dad. And so what does the show look like without him? What does Zoe's life look like without him? Those things are very related. And I miss Lauren's presence so much. Um, I'm still hoping that there's, you know, a future in which Joan reappears just like Peter has or Mitch. Yeah. I, th I certainly hope so too. Um, I actually talked to Skylar last week and he made a very good point that even if you are not singing on the show in most of these performance scenes, you are still involved with your reactions to the extent that you're all, it's almost kind of like having you part of the performance. Um, and I'm just wondering if you had a scene from this season that stood out to you when even if you weren't singing, it was just especially memorable, just in terms of choreography or the way the other person was performing or any reason? Um, yeah, all of them. <laughs> I'm not just <laughs> standing there, you know, like ever. And I don't even mean like physically, I'm not just standing there. Sometimes I move my body. I just mean that, you know, these musical numbers are through Zoe, they're her perspective. And so I am very involved in every single number. I'm not sure I have one that sticks out particularly, you know, people ask, often ask me like, what's my favorite number? And that's like asking what's your favorite child or something. Like, I just feel like it's, it's impossible to answer. Um, do you have a favorite number from the season or a couple favorites? I mean, just the insane just scope of don't stop me now is mm -hmm. so memorable. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah. And um, shake it off, certainly, in the finale. Um, so you like the big numbers. You don't like the individual ones. Or I'm not saying you don't like. Sometimes, you know, the, the more intimate numbers, a moment like this and Into You, those are good, too. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Well, so now when you, you bring up, like, Zoe being a part of these numbers, halfway through the season, I approached Mandy and I said, you know, I can't just stand here all the time like I really I feel like I need to be incorporated into these numbers not just for my own like entertainment but because I think it serves the story and it's more dynamic when Zoe's involved and like you know I think that often my job is to like set up the musical numbers like if you're not emotionally invested in the storyline before the number happens you're not going to be and you know like for example in the pilot episode when I sit next to my dad and I'm very upset and I'm telling him about how much I need him and how unfair it is. And then he sings. It's like the musical number is, you know, I, I sort of am like the assister. I like throw the ball and then there's the, the, the hit or something. I don't know. I don't bad sports analogy. But but so so I always find that if if it's my job to make sure these numbers land to be like at the edge of your seat, an audience member about like, what's going to happen to this person. And then the musical number is sort of like the, I don't even know what to say. The, the musical number is like the <laughs> climax, I guess, in some way, you know, like yeah. the performance leading up to it, then there's the climax and then there's the resolution. And so into you, uh, I, I, so I approached Manny and I said, I really feel like I need to be a part of this more, not only for my own entertainment, for storytelling purposes. And also I just think this, this person who's been living with this power for almost a year, I don't know how long it's actually been, she wouldn't just stand there anymore, wouldn't you? If you found out you could like, yeah. you you were having lucid dreams and you knew you were dreaming, wouldn't you like experiment? So into you, I, I and I remember calling Austin and saying, is there a number coming up where I can participate? I was like, I actually even asked, I was like, is there one with Jon Stewart? Because I love dancing with Jon Stewart. And he was like, well, he's gonna sing Into You to you. And I said, oh, okay, well, can there be a version in which I am like folding into him, but I never touch him because I'm afraid that if I touch him, then the music will stop. And so that was actually my idea. I will take credit for this number. And, <laughs> uh, you know, I actually can't watch it because it's a little too, <laughs> it makes yeah. me uncomfortable I'm like uh-uh um but I'm always trying to figure out ways with Mandy and Austin to involve Zoe not just with the camera showing my red hair and from my perspective but more in a um, involved way because I just think it's more fun and dynamic sure 
Um, and just going back to some of the plot of the season, um, we 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 do a big flashback in the penultimate episode to Zoe's first day at Spark Point, and we come to discover that Max has essentially sacrificed his position to make sure Zoe got the job and didn't tell her about it until it finally comes out in the finale, which is like six years later. Um, have you thought at all actually about how things would have been different if Zoe just knew that up front what Max did? I'm curious how you think Zoe would react to that. You're bringing up a really good question because this was actually like when I was saying before, I'm not often like, can we change the storyline or can we adjust this? This was a situation in which I had very strong opinions about it. Um, I, the way that it was first pitched to me was that, <laughs> what do you, can I ask you first, what would, how, do, how would you feel if you were in Zoe's position and you found out six years later, what do you think you would feel more touched or more embarrassed or a combo of two? definitely a combo of two in the in the vein of how zoe reacts in terms of like just i like denial at first and anger but then ultimately like trying to understand that there's a deeper point to it you know right um (laughs) i don't know how to it's funny you're really bringing up like something that i've thought so much about and when i watched it i was like huh okay so Originally, it was sort of pitched to me that that was going to make her realize that was the moment that was going to make her realize that she wants to be with this person. And Mm -hmm. I pushed back very hard against that because I was like, I think I would be so embarrassed that a whole group of people knew a secret about me, especially like Zoe, who is like incredibly ambitious and is like, you know, the thing that she's the one place she's confident is in her like coding skills and to find out that she didn't actually deserve that, that someone just like gave it to her out of charity. I pushed for that because I felt very strongly that it would be rocky and, and, but, but embarrassing. And um, anyways, that's where we ended up. And I'm glad that you follow, I guess if we were to go back and Zoe were to find out I'm not sure. I'm not sure it would change anything because he already showed up at the hospital and they already had that, you know, moment. And the dad, Mitch says that I think that she put Max in the friend zone because she's an incredibly afraid person. I don't think that. I don't know. It's a good question. I I don't know. (laughs) I don't know what she would have done if she knew at the time. Yeah. Well, let's talk a bit of spoilers here. So if anyone who hasn't watched through the finale of season two, the very climactic finale, um, you're going to want to duck out now and come back to this later. But at the end of the finale, we have Max changing his mind about going to New York and he wants to be with Zoe and Zoe wants to be with him. And then Zoe performs a heart song that Max is, I think, able to hear or he thinks that that is what's happening. what did you think when you found out that Max might have actually inherited her powers? Um, well, when I first found out, I was like, well, how, you know, is, yeah. how does that work? Like, did, did they sneak into the hospital and she shoved him into the MRI machine and now he has the power? Um, I personally love when the show uh, explores the mythology behind the power because I think that, you know, things have to have meaning in storytelling. And for me, at, since the beginning, I don't know if you've heard me talk about this. I'm sorry if it's like old news, but I, um, I've always felt that the, Zoe's gift, is supernatural gift, is related to the passing of her father. So when someone dies, I feel like, or when you're mourning and when you're grieving, your view becomes very, your worldview becomes very small. And, you know, I, I imagine that like, you're not as present and you're not like taking in everything around you. And so 
when she gets this gift of like connection and empathy, I feel like it's sort of like, okay, when you, when you're losing this person, you also have to look around you and life will continue. And there is like, there's beauty in death and there's beauty in goodbye and, you know, listen to the melody in life. So with Max getting the power, I feel like it's also, you know, when in the dream, Mitch says that, who do you think you're talking to? I'm part of the universe now. I feel like it was a gift from her father to make her be able to be in relationship with this person because, you know, something that this show has been building for two seasons is that when one person can hear someone's thoughts and the other person can't, it creates an imbalance. And so for Max to have the power, maybe they will be able to work. Hmm. Interesting. Does that make sense? (laughs) Yeah. Well, it just really makes you want a a third season to explore some of this stuff here because it could take the show in a very new direction. What are you excited to explore if you get the chance to get that third season that you maybe you haven't so far? I am really excited to sing and dance more. You know, like I am the lead of Zoe's Extraordinary Playlist, but I only sang four times this season and I love performing. (laughs) And so in season three, when, since Max is able to hear Zoe's thoughts, that gives room for me to sing and dance. Man, I can't wait. Fingers crossed. Wow. Anything with just, you know, the character dynamics and things of that nature? Oh yeah. I think that Mo and Zoe should go to Paris. Um, Okay. Lionsgate. (laughs) (laughs) I like that. Um, yeah, I would love the world, you know, now, I, I mean, I can't, I don't know what the hell is going to happen in terms of like, where we can shoot with the pandemic and what's going to happen with the vaccine. I'm hoping that by the next season, we are able to open up the show a little bit more and, and not only shoot on the studio. And I, I just would, you know, the show is, is a fantastical reality. So the bigger the world, I think the more fun. And I would love to, you know, take things outside of Spark Point, take things outside of the Clark house or my apartment. Yeah, I think that would be very interesting. Um, Well, for those of you watching, subscribe for more award season interviews and head to goldderby.com to make your Emmy predictions. Jane, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you so much. 